This is Podkit, episode number 17, Life with Tuples, on Tuesday, January 12th, 2016. And now, it would be fun to be in the modern world. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, that's me, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk17. Yes, well, welcome to the 17th episode of the podcast. How, how are you, all of you doing? Doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. How are you guys? I am, I'm fairly well. Yeah. Doing well myself. We are all well, guys. You know, but you know what's not well? <laughs> Our internet well. might not be too well. So if during this episode you hear us completely drop out or something like that, well, you know what happened. <laughs> it's probably that, yep. And in addition to that issue, my mixer has decided to inject some subtle noise into our lines. So I can't fix it right now, but hopefully by episode 29, you won't hear it. That's a good goal. It yes. gives, gives us some time to figure it all out. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Yep, you betcha. So, what's in your bash profile? T uh, what is it? T shell profile? Well, I don't Z-shell. use... I, I use ZSH. ZS... Wait, Z, that's what I was trying to think of. Oh, that's probably Z... Maybe that's Does Z-shell, Brian, then. Does Brian sell seashells by the seashore? <laughs> I don't know. It's possible. Well, I, I use Z-shell also, like Ryan. Now, I only use that on the Mac. On on the uh, Linux servers that I run, which are all over the place, of course, I, I use the Bash because I don't want to install more things. Although I do miss the, my nice ZSH cool stuff whenever I'm over there. See, I've taken the exact opposite approach to Ryan, and I install Z Shell everywhere I go because uh, because consistency trumps any sort of logical thing in my brain about using the thing that's already there for me. May as well, you know, if I have a VPS, if I'm paying five bucks a month for it, it may as well. Uh, look exactly like everything else, just slightly different, um, because um, be- for reasons I'll talk to you guys about in just a couple minutes. Um, so I do use Z Shell everywhere, and my Z Shell profile is automatically generated by Oh My Z Shell, which is a thing that a person named Robbie Russell made uh, to make customizing Z Shell a little bit easier. Do you use that, Ryan? I don't think so. It's I think I've heard of that. Which is pretty good for not using it. Probably. Totally. <laughs> it's it's pretty slick. Uh, one of the things that it's really good for is using themes. Uh, and I actually have a custom theme that I built. And by built, I mean stole from one of the uh, MIT licensed ones that are on GitHub. Uh, I think the original one is called like N. But I added uh, I added a letter to it and I call it no. <laughs> no, wow. that was the theme. That's creative. Um, very yeah, that's I excellent. Know. Yeah. So let's see. I think I found a link for it right here. Okay, I, I, I corrected my stance on that when I said I don't think so. The answer is I totally do. I just didn't recognize the person's name. Gotcha, gotcha. No worries. Well, it's, it's pretty slick. One of the things that I like about my slightly different version is that in place of something that I found totally useless in the in the original theme, um, I started putting the the vendor name in uh, in the prompt, so I can tell whether I'm on an Ubuntu box, a Red Hat box, an Apple box, or a Debian box. However, the mm. thing that's kind of frustrating is that the Debian box actually says uh, it lists itself as PC as the vendor. So if you, if you do like Echo vendor, it or you know dollar vendor, it will. Um, It'll it'll say PC and it won't say it won't say Debian. That kind of made me sad, but whatever. So sad. Yeah, uh, my but theme. Else, I'm not. Says, I don't know uh, what theme. Is there an easy way to tell what theme you run? Yeah, uh, if you echo uh, echo dollar zsh underscore theme. Okay, I guess I'm running the default theme then. <laughs> nice. There you go. I like defaults. Very pleased with them. Yeah. So I'm all boring apparently, and I run Bash, but I just recently updated to Bash four via Homebrew, so that was kind of cool. I don't run a theme, but I have a theme terminal 
uh, for OS X terminal right. theme kind of thing I use, which is nice. So that works together well with what I have set up. However, it makes SSHing quite horrible because I have some color things I've changed inside of Bash that make SSHing look kind of bad. So that's a thing I need to work on at some point. Yeah, nice. So what other things sort of do you thing. have in your in your RC file or profile file? I add user local bin to my path. I turn okay. on CLI color, uh, Xterm color. I do some LS colors, so color is always fun. And then I have <laughs> uh, grep always use colors. And then I export some color modifications. No, wait, that's not it. I changed the login prompt, so instead of whatever OS ten default is, it says... Uh, Bracket, uh, username at hostname space, and then in yellow the path um, from user home user home folder, I believe. Nice. Or at least that's used till the one it's in my home folder, and then another bracket, and then dollar sign, and then everything after there is what I type. And then I alias ll to be ls dash lah because that's a nice handy command. Yeah, that is nice. And then Hiroko bin, and then I use another. Uh, uh, another thing I need to eval. Nice, oh, nice. I see in uh, yeah, your image. So you you have your host name, Brandon. Yep. Before, okay. Nice. Oh, uh, what what's, what do you use to to get the name? I just tried on OS ten, dollar Veco and or wow. That was a mix of vendor and echo became Veco. So the the thing that I think is um let me see if I can pull up file in particular here. Right. So I get the current directory with print working directory, yada yada. Mm -hmm. Um I get host with echo host. Um I get the user at machine in directory sort of thing with uh so box name is is what what host is stored in um what 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 else is missing user is just a dollar user but huh that's a good question i think it's it should all be in that no zs no zsh dot theme that i put in the show notes okay I forgot the question. I managed to talk my way out of remembering what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of ran into the same thing also. So I think what I have used is uh, P, a bash PS1 generator. That's what I used right. to generate mine. And that was pretty nice. Uh, I don't know which one I used, but I just Googled it or Dr. Go it. And it was the first one. Nice. Yeah. So that's kind of nice. Totally. Maybe this bash RC generator because it looks like a drag and drop, and I feel like that's what I used. Sure enough, yeah, that looks awesome. You might have heard a Twitter just go off. That happened. So I did in, not hear a Twitter go off. In in my ZSH RC file, I have countless exports to Path, like twenty of them, for various oh, wow. things. Um. I have uh, Java tools for various Android versions in my path that also sometimes causes confusion. I have various Scala paths because I was learning Scala at one point and quit when I found out that it isn't for me. Um, <laughs> I have Hugo, the blogging, the it's kind of like Jekyll, you know, the thing that uh, generates yeah. static files. Uh, let's see, what else do I have? I have Go. I have Rust. I have multiple versions of PHP path exports, and nice, nice. Um, so there's the there's those are those things. And then in my alias folder or file, I guess uh, I have nothing, and that's because <laughs> I took it all out and put it into its own place, which is dot zsh functions. And nice, nice. those are quite different. Instead, I have all of my, I guess we, I guess you would call them SSH shortcuts. But yeah, yeah. Um, as you know, I have a static IP address nowhere in my life, except yeah. on my 
public server up on Linode. And yep. I have my little dynamic DNS generator from my home server ping my real server every few minutes to update that IP address for a, uh, a name redirect, maybe? I'm not sure right, what, right, what right. letter. But um, I basically have all these little bash-like scripts run in the ZSH thing, and I can type in, for example, SSHL when I'm at home, and that'll connect me just to my local server. If I type in SSH Grail, which is my remote server's name, it will query the server for its actual IP address and then SSH to it. Nice. If if I do SSH home, it will SSH to my home server when I'm outside of the house. So those things are really cool. Yeah, definitely. Good shortcuts. Yeah, that's awesome. I think the only the only exports I really have, I, I don't think I have any exports on this computer, but on my Mac, I remember setting up uh, rather recently a couple of shortcuts, and they're really silly. Um, the first one I can think of is RSpec C. So RSpec being the testing framework for Ruby. Uh, I use it in a couple of Rails applications for work. And RSpec C is just an alias that uh, automatically calls the, you know, basically the pretty printing flag and gives me fancy colors. Most other testing suites I've used, like Cucumber, for example. Uh, well, cu so Cucumber is different because Cucumber is is different. Cucumber is more of a way of gluing uh, like business processy language to your functional test. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Have you, have you guys worked with that at all yet? Or have I told you guys about it before? I think you I've used it. Cucumber for one class last spring. There are some right, tests right, written right. in Cucumber. Yeah. I, don't, I don't write tests. I don't <laughs> write them. I use them. <laughs> I live the on the edge. Them. <laughs> yeah. I... I just that like my my tap my talk my lightning talk uh, last week was pretty heavily focused on cucumber. I'm a huge fan of it. I think it makes writing functional tests really easy, especially just based on the work that I do. It seems like the test scripts are basically already written. You just need to get something, some machine to do it for you. But the the goal of all that stuff I just said is to illustrate that basically every other testing framework I've used, whether it's Mocha, whether it's QUnit, output stuff in a really nice. Um, pretty printing way by default, right? It includes the nice little shell colors and all that stuff. But for some reason, RSpec doesn't. So for that reason, I added RSpec C. <laughs> But that's literally like the only shell alias I can remember adding. I, maybe I did a couple for Docker back in the day, but ever since then, I just started typing Docker. Every so often on a computer or a VM I'm using, I will try yep. adding all those popular Get shortcuts, get aliases, right, right. and I never can remember them, so I always just end up using the regular long form. Right. So right, much for that. Yeah. That's right. Somebody did send me at one point, like Dan Menson. He's uh, he works at Olson, uh, a digital marketing firm in Minneapolis. Um, he's also one of the organizers of JavaScript Minnesota. He's a very cool person. Um, he had this uh, Git shortcut that's like G L O G Git log. Uh, for, for a git log mm -hmm. but it did a really awesome again like kind of pretty printing yeah. version, and it shows it all kind of like in a tree mode and i love it mm -hmm. um, in fact i wonder if i have it here i might i might and i might not nope don't have it womp, womp. oh no i do have it i just i'm not in the git repository right now i just look at that oh i don't know if i can screenshot on this computer though oopsies yeah i did look at that Learning all sorts of things. <laughs> Remember, I had a, a GitHub guest I just added to the the show notes, so people can see my. You know, for a second uh, there, I thought you shared all your like public and private keys. Like, whoa! <laughs> I don't think there's anything there. No, it's it's my uh, edited terminal theme for OS X and my VimRC and my Bash profile. Very nice. So yeah, it's got all the good stuff. Yeah, you need more exports, man. Gotta export way more. You should. Oh, this isn't a repository. I was gonna say you should pull request it. Well, I mean, you <laughs> I also think you can comment, can't you? It's on. Uh, can you? I don't know. 
Yeah, yeah you can I comment down below. Well, I mean, you also need to have all the associated binaries in the back, but yeah, there's that. <laughs> nah, those don't matter. Nah, that's fine. Just reinstall it every time you run the command. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, okay, what else do we have here? Uh, so for one thing, uh, Ian Murdoch, uh, he was the founder of Debian and uh, kind of the the uh, benevolent, uh, what do they say, benevolent dictator of Debian for, uh, for some time. Uh, looks like uh, he died rather suddenly uh, over the last weekend. Really just kind of a super sad situation. Um, but uh, he had a huge impact on, I think, uh, the work that all of us do mm -hmm. uh, here. So I encourage you to, dear listener, go do some reading about this person if you haven't heard of him. Uh, he's really cool. He did a lot of things for the profession uh, and a lot of things to encourage people to make the tech world a better place. It definitely seems like, you know, that there are a lot of people in our field, people like Linus, who are kind of divisive uh or otherwise kind of like shouty people and it doesn't that uh, you know it doesn't really feel like ian was one of those people or even if you know another shouty person might be like um the the new guy what's his name the GNU guy who's gonna punch me because i said new instead of GNU. uh <gasps> rms oh, okay yeah, yeah Stallman. Stallman. Okay. right like like shouty people like that ian wasn't one of those people or at least he didn't seem like that um he did lots of lots of really awesome positive things with debian later open solaris and docker um so yeah sad hmm. stuff yeah uh, from what i've read on the reddit and elsewhere nobody really knows what exactly happened it's sort of uh as you mentioned mysterious yeah i remember seeing something on reddit the with some mysterious tweets the day before he yeah. broke that he had died so who knows? Definitely, definitely. It's just really sad and yeah, weird. Yeah, sad story. But, um, you know, this, this guy has had quite an impressive resume. I mean, after after Debian, uh, he worked with Sun and basically created the Open Solaris project. Um, and then after that, he worked with a company that's kind of near and dear to my heart, Exact Target, because uh, Exact Target, for, the, for those of you who haven't seen my numerous tweets is a mass email system uh that's in use at the u right now that i that i use quite frequently at work um and then after that he moved to docker which of course is another of my favorite companies so this dude is like all over the things that i use on a daily basis uh, and if you've touched a linux server in the past however long linux has been around you've probably used something that he's used or that that he wrote mm -hmm. um or that he was mm -hmm. in some way shape or form involved with so it's pretty yeah, pretty sad stuff. Anyhow, there's other stuff that's going on in the world that's not quite as sad too, including but not limited to something that I'm not familiar with that's in the show notes. Now, I don't <laughs> remember who put this here. Did I put this here? Did it wasn't me. Okay, so then I guess it must have been me, but <laughs> I don't remember not. doing it either. Um, this is what happens when we have show notes that are carried over week to week, right? Uh, yep. So I guess I put this search engine watch article about uh, good and bad and ugly web design trends for 2016, which is mm -hmm. apparently a way to say this is what we saw in 15. This is probably what you'll see after. Uh, so briefly, we can go through here. Um, they talk about how all the pages for landing pages look the same. You know, it's some some kind of muted background with some big white text on the top. Uh, let's see what else do we have. We have patterns, not pages. So it, you know, you you see the same kind of buttons every single place, and all of this UI looks the same all over the place, and nothing really looks unique anymore. Uh, we have Disney grade animation, which is apparently uh, what they're calling motion. Uh, all these th things animate and move all around the page. Yep. Um, the one I like the best, of course, is uh, the carryover from the original Verge, which turned into Bloomberg Politics and Bloomberg Business, or just Bloomberg. And that's when Topolsky yep. took over and made the best design ever. 
and they call it super saturated websites. And man, <laughs> that uh, that Bloomberg website sure looks good. It does, doesn't it? Oh man, I just man, if I was a designer right now, copying something for the Nexus, uh, hmm, I don't know what any kind of inspiration <laughs> I'd be pulling from that. Yeah, uh, I have we... to admit, like the the Bloomberg web folks seem to be really rocking it, and they have been for ages. Like their content is just a joy to consume. Yes, on the on the Apple News or on the web, it's just like oh, darn good. And then, of course, we have the blurred background, which I am guilty of doing. Uh, <laughs> we have the uh, Facebook endorsed subtle loading pages or subtle loading states. That's it's kind of a cool feature. I don't know if you guys have seen it too often, but uh, I've seen yeah. it on the Facebook where they'll display bl- a blank avatar square and a blank name spot, date spot, and then some blank paragraph spots. And it's actually really a, a really cool effect. Yeah, I feel like I yeah I've seen that. It's a good easing in of not just subtle loading, but a, like a and. I don't know how they do it exactly. It's probably, you know, some kind of React magic. So, like, they fetch all the pieces discreetly, and then they join it up on the client side. But it's a really right. neat idea. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what they mean by it, but they're calling it the uh, mullet website. Uh, yeah. Uh, preloaders are all the rage now because apparently loading five megabytes of CSS and JavaScript is um, your idea of a good time. In 2016, <laughs> uh, scroll hijacking, scroll jacking. Uh, uh, that is the worst, isn't it? The worst. Yep. Oh my gosh, I have to find that. Reminds me, there's this really awesome, uh, and by awesome I mean horrible, uh, apartment complex in Dinky Town that has this gloriously scroll jacked website. I'll mute <laughs> I'll, I'll my microphone and look for it. Okay. And you guys can keep talking about it. So let's see. Uh, we have passive aggressive pop-ups and that's when these pop-ups will pop up but not immediately when you get to the page they'll pop up midway down so you're you're in three paragraphs in you have to scroll for the first time and suddenly do you want to join our email list yes or no Ugh, yeah that's like it's like a delayed ad yeah after they know you're there long enough that you're committed so now right. they can force this on you yeah well they and they know that they that you want to finish the rest of the article so you have to interact with it yeah and yeah exactly yeah exactly or it's it's like the on some sites i haven't seen it too much lately where you have to you know oh i guess i've seen you continue reading after two paragraphs yeah but sometimes they say oh you have to pay or lock in or something Mm -hmm. just uh, we also have the so long hamburger section, which is the trend of removing hamburger buttons from not only websites but but also apps. Now I don't really see hamburger buttons on the web ever, except when I'm on mobile. So yeah. I guess that's a fine thing there. But I guess the trend now in in most uh, Android apps anyway is to get rid of the hamburger, which is terrible because I love that thing. I think it's a pretty horrible user interface. I'm not in saying the, like, that it's overall. I, I think it's good. Interface um, is okay. I think it's good for a lot of things. So uh, YouTube used to uh, have... So they're, they're showing the YouTube app here. Yeah. And previously in the hamburger button, you would just swipe from the left to the right, and you could see all of the places you subscribe to who have updated recently in, in that you know recent order. And it was super quick to get to a sub. Really great. But now to get to a sub you have to click the middle button on the topsicle and then click in a uh, like a little arrow off to the side to get to your list of subs in recent order and mm. it's it's a, it's a it's a suckier way to do it even if it's more exposed to the user yeah you could yeah because with the hamburger you are you have a lot more of space i guess cuz you just yeah. pop in a list and scroll to your heart's content i would say that yes yeah, I have to admit, I am. Uh, uh, I'm satisfied just to walk both sides of this debate. I'm not a huge fan of the hamburger. I, it's a big reason why I'm not a huge fan of Chrome because I really despise having all of my menus on, like hidden underneath one click. It feels like it's one more click, to that removes me from the things that I need to do. But, I. I understand why it exists, but and and I use it quite frequently. 
in other things, but it's just like. So is there a, a comparable thing in iOS to a hamburger? Is that is that a design thing in iOS? You know, I, I have to I have to say that the best thing I can think of is the iOS share button. Okay. Right. Uh, so it's it's not so much like a more indicator, mm-hmm. right? Um, but I, it I opens like a little it, pane at the bottom, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It, but I, it, it pulls up. You can it, but sharing has changed so much since I feel like just iOS seven with because with the yeah. extensions. You know, originally it was okay, share, post to Facebook, post to Twitter, send an email. But now it's yeah. open in Dropbox. You can copy it there, open in Google Drive. Um, and then underneath, there's like your extensions. So uh, yeah. open URL in a non browser uh, or yeah. like in a content free app or something like mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Or I, I use it a lot for like workflows, right? So the workflow yeah. app, which is really awesome. Uh, you know, if I want to plop something into Pocket, or if I want to plop something into Evernote, or if I want to plop something and run it through like a some sort of a a parser, right, and save it to like the biggest thing. Oh my gosh, I can print stuff to my printer because of workflow, right? Um, and that's it's it's like a weird definition of sharing, but sharing in the sense of like get this thing out of this app and into another thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I see it kind of as like the iOS like replacement for the hamburger icon. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's similar, but even even the even the Android sharing button is similar to that. It'll open up a, a pane where you can click an app to go and share to. Huh. I mean, I guess I, know I guess the hamburger for me is a, a great way to put in functionality and other places in your app or website that you don't necessarily have to be greeted with. Yeah, but I think it it also takes away from core things. It just people, you know, people uh, developers can, you know, if it's hard to make a decision about whether to keep or lose something from the main, so just add it all to the hamburger. I feel like it it pulls away from a focus on the app, other than just the very initial thing that you're doing. It might make it look cleaner, but then you're just hiding away in the corner. I don't know. I mean, I mean, sometimes you just can't have uh, all of these terrible things that are useful, but out in the open. Yeah. yeah. But then does your app do too much for what it's... <laughs> well, how many different Facebook apps can a person have? Yeah. And Google I, would I have saying, you in believe... In an ideal world. Google would have you believe you could have a lot of Facebook apps. I mean, YouTube apps. Yeah, right, right. I I think it's definitely a philosophical thing and 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 if I if I were operating in a purely theoretical world, I'd probably say that I am pretty significantly anti-hamburger. But that said, I use it all the time in in day-to-day work, but I I I tend to veer towards a more um as, as best I can to to categorize things, make it kind of tree-based in that way instead of instead of uh Kind of as Brian said, putting it all under the hamburger, or at least I like to think I do. <laughs> okay, so got another one here then. Heavy yep. pages are getting heavier. So they say that in 2010, the average weight of the top one, uh, 1 million sites was 702 kilobytes, you know, all assets included. Now they say in 2015, which is only a mere five years later, the average web page load for those same three or i mean the same million sites is 2.2 megabytes oh my gosh so it's it's not quite three times as much but it's it's at least a doubling and I'm so curious how does that compare when graphed to ad blocker usage huh. well i am sure that um i'm sure that a lot of that is ads uh they don't say here in their image breakdown but if we assume that any script or at least half the script is add. So in 2010, 103, 113 kilobytes of scripting, and then in 2015, 368 kilobytes of scripting. So if we assume script tags load JavaScript, yep. Uh, I mean for ads, it would say that you're probably not cutting that much down then. You know, and there's yeah. there's other things you could point to also. Like if you pointed towards like uh, the inclusion of high resolution imagery for new modern high density screens. Yeah, that's true. Um, if you include um, 
Previously, we were only including two kilobytes worth of font data. Now we're including uh, 114 kilobytes. That's a big jump. Um, yeah. You know, HTML has been fairly static because really, what can you add to it? CSS has, um, you know, tripled 25 to 75 KB. Yep. I think it also just shows the increasing use of mobile websites on smartphones and um, more powerful, more powerful computers, the evolution of what ECRAScript five, when did that come out? I don't know. Um, it's HTML five kind of wasn't, was still coming out in 2010. Yeah. I mean, that was what? And the so it's, year? it's kind of, the explosion of the new modern web. Right? Like, what was 2010? Oh. That was the first year of the iPad, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was back when Flash was still a thing. And I would I would venture that those top 1 million sites included a lot of Flash, but that wasn't listed here. So maybe mm-hmm. it's not as bad as we all think it is. That's true. That's true. Yeah, other did shrink from 22 kilobytes to 4. Yeah, but I think Flash is heavier than 22 kilobytes. That's sure. for sure. Okay, well, let's see. Well, what do we got here next? Uh, according to um, that, I also posted a link to my e-voting website that I did for a final a few weeks ago. And nice. uh, the reason I included this is because I have the blurred background. Mm-hmm. Um, but this also gives me the opportunity to talk a little bit about foundation because we love talking about foundation, right? Yeah, foundation is awesome. So, so I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I've heard also. Uh, so Foundation 6 recently came out, and one of the reasons I um, picked t- to do this website instead of letting somebody else in my group was to try using Foundation 6. Well, at the time, Foundation 6 had just come out, and it was quite buggy. There were bugs just everywhere. Um, whether those bugs were things like somebody mistyped the word rem, and they typed in like RAM with two M's, oh, and, no. and and so the default width didn't work, and so that's why this website is full width. Hmm. Uh, so that's pretty funny, um, and and so since then there's been quite a few bug fixes. Uh, six point one and six point one one of Foundation Six have come out, and uh, I appreciate a lot of those bug fixes. Um, even though I'm not using like the flux grid and I'm not necessarily doing anything with the fancy JavaScript components, I, I, I do enjoy there being, you know, uh, uh, less than a 20 day difference between broken and now working. Totally. That's pretty awesome. So I, uh, uh, there's, yeah, go mm-hmm. ahead. There is one more thing I want to, I want to show you guys. And that is this, uh, Dinky Town oh, rentals golden uh, website. Where's this? Uh, Wow. This, yeah. Just just start scrolling. Uh, and uh, okay. 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 I'm scrolling and I'm puking. It started at first. Like, it's kind of strange, but cool looking. Why did they decide to do it this way? Just don't go too fast. It's even better if you open it on mobile. Nothing happens. Okay. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to do that, but wow. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Uh, a friend and collaborator of mine, uh, brought that brought that to my attention it's pretty amazingly bad you know, you know what's even better though what they left their camera's date stamp on you are fast to find that yeah. out i mean oh, oh I... I see oh on the photo oh wow i thought you were looking at exit for something yeah that's pretty <laughs> that's pretty that's something <laughs> <laughs> yep so i guess uh, i guess i can say with with not too much discomfort that my website for my little class was better than this this uh, brochure page here you, oh, you don't lock out 60 percent of your users <laughs> so that's good oh man that that's not that's not the best that i've seen yep. you know i guess that's one of those things you'd like hey can i make a squarespace page for you right right yeah, it seems like they have a web person. If if you look at it, it seems like they definitely have somebody on their team who does web stuff. But it looks like they're just trolling them hard. Oh, you know, <laughs> I've I've never heard of this. What is Muse? It's some kind of Adobe thing. Oh, really? That's uh, what I'm reading. 
Uh, Adobe Confidential. This is in the Muse Redirect.js. Muse Redirect. All the information can, contained here within remains the property of Adobe. Blah 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 blah. Adobe. Huh. So maybe they use some kind of Adobe tool to make this. Now yeah, you know it's more it's, fun. It seems um, more complicated, but in their um, in their what is it? Their head tag. They have a uh, a link for. Yeah. To, uh, mobile, I guess, yep. max with a 370, which is just to the same URL, but instead of .html, or it's slash phone slash index.html. And it's just a blank page that <laughs> says scroll for more information. But it's not blank and at it, the bottom. There's one picture. <laughs> it's tiny. Yeah, it makes no sense. You know, I feel kind of bad dissecting a person's work on a podcast such as this. But, you know, I guess when you put your thing up on the web, um, anybody can go and look at it, and it's not like we're not offering constructive criticism. If if it gets fixed and we and our they want our opinion in the future, we would be glad to give it. We would. It's just it's just amazing that they. Um, it's, it's just amazing. It's so it's so fun that they made this though. It's so like that's. It it's kind of fun to look at on desktop. I th- I think because I don't see yeah. things like this very often. Well, and it, it looks like professionally done. It's it's clear that whoever did this, it's it's not like the person who did this is like a bad person by any no. stretch of the means. Or it doesn't even seem like they're bad at, at what they do. It seems like they're really good at what they do. It just looks like they're having fun with whoever hired them to do it. They might have just picked the wrong way to design the page. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that was fun. Uh, yeah, Foundation's cool. JavaScript's cool. Everybody loves all those things. Let's talk about something that's 20 years old, and it's neither of us. IPv6. So this was from January 3rd, a Ars Technica article about IPv6 celebrating its 20th birthday by reaching 10% deployment. Have you guys ever been on a connection with IPv6? I think I've been at the U of M, and I'm pretty sure I've seen my IPv6 address there. That's it. I feel like I've seen at the U of M like an internal IPv6, but external v4. I don't know. I think I was I was in Amsterdam this I think it was Amsterdam this December earlier in December and I was at my Airbnb and they I think had an IPv6 address which is the first time I've ever noticed one. So that was kind of cool. So uh a couple of, a couple of things of kind of immediate follow up. Uh actually the use IP addresses are uh public info uh and we do have both uh, v4 and v6 address space. Uh, we have some allocated to us from internet too, and we have some allocated to us straight from the uh, American registry for internet, uh, you know, like assigned numbers, yeah. right? Who, who's Aaron. that? I, I know, or I can. Uh, it's, I think it's Aaron. A R I N. Which gets, oh, okay. Yeah, American registry for internet numbers. Yay. Uh, but I think that's like the ICANN affiliate in the US. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And I think we have a bunch of private address. Yeah, well, I could. I guess I could read it out or I could just give you guys a link. Eh? Man, look <laughs> at how much simpler the IPv6 header is compared to the IPv4 header. No, totally. It's almost like that somebody figured out how to make a header in, you know, in 25 years. <laughs> Who knew? So how, how, do you, how do you guys feel about this uh, this rollout duration here? Uh, I wish I had it because that'd be kind of fun to be in the modern world. <laughs> so I guess I'm I'm kind of I have mixed feelings. So I have personally written scripts that absolutely depend on an IP address being a fixed size, and when those scripts suddenly start getting forty character long addresses, it's not going to be pretty. Uh huh. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's true. I, I feel like there's a lot of old things that will break with V6, and that's probably why it's taking so long. But on the other hand, I am not opposed to breaking things irreparably. I'm I'm okay with change. Just lay it on me. Come on, Quest. Yep. I mean, Centrelink. Do it. Do it now. Yeah, I'm going to be using Centrelink this spring semester as well, so I'm assuming it's no different in Morris than it is in St. Paul. So my, uh, my Centrelink modem has on it uh the ipv4 header 
I mean, not header, uh, IP address listed. But right below it, it also has IPv6, and then it says not set. Hmm. Well, at least they thought about it when they made sticker. Yeah, you know, all these years ago. Yeah, I'm reckoning that, you know, modem, the, as I've mentioned, the Zyxel Q100. Yep. DSL modem router that uh, probably doesn't support, well, it probably does support V6, but maybe not. Because V6 support came out in the early 2000s. I remember, I don't know, old. you can go to old versions of OS X and still see their networking tab, IVv6 options. That's so funny, because I'm totally sure Windows XP nice. didn't have it. Yeah. I will. I will admit. I'm. I'm on my. Uh, my uh, login page right now, and I can see it through the the router admin page, and I can see that um, internally we're all IP4, but I think externally. Well, you know, when I upgrade to my Ubiquity network, you know, next year, hey, you yep. know, it's all going to be IPv6 in the house. Oh, except for all those clients that can't figure that out. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. I think. So we're all we're we're a, we're a Mac only family here, except for except for my one solitary Linux computer and a couple of Raspberry Pis and the internet connected TV. Uh, and I think so. You're all Unixy. Yeah. Yep. That's no, what matters. Not a lick of Windows. Not a lick of Windows. That's okay. Um, but our uh, I, I don't, so I think that that means that every every client we have should be able to handle IPv6 just fine, but those numbers are scary. So for that reason, uh, we'll we'll turn it on at some point, but um, maybe you know certainly not tonight. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, when Comcast does it, it'll be really slick because I mean, as we know, it's a real crisis that we're running out of numbers and we have to buy numbers from other people. These numbers have already been in use and all that fun stuff. Yeah, you know, like when I bought my VPS for from Linode a couple years ago, yep. they gave me, you know, you just get a static IP, and I yep. remember, you know, just salivating at the thought of having a static IP from a shared host, like. <gasps> Come right? on! Oh, it'd be so good. Do it now, and totally. suddenly you just you're just given one for a VPS, and I'm I'm I assume that everybody who signs up to Linode and probably DigitalOcean and you know VPS vendors in general, you just get a static IP because otherwise, how do you do it really? And yeah, I yeah. just I find it to be so fascinating that they can just give people individual numbers, and yet we're running out at the same time. Totally, absolutely. And then on the other hand, on the other extreme. Um, you can have four quadrillion IPv6 numbers all to yourself. So, you know, you just get to pick what you want, I guess. Yeah. Better start configuring VMs to use all four quadrillion. <laughs> I might, might have to do that. That sure is an awful lot of VMs, but somehow I'm I'm kind of down for it. I'm ready for it. <laughs> yep. Cool. Well, there are a couple more things that I wanted to bring up here. Uh, the first one being... Uh, Intermez OS, which is a uh, little kind of teaching operating system by a couple of cool people around the Twitter sphere. Uh, the first being Steve Klabnik of Twitter fame. He did a lot of the documentation for the Rust programming language. And uh, AG underscore dubs on Twitter, Ashley Williams, who is uh, involved with a lot of positive uh, kind of uh, changes on the, on the node front. Uh, she is the chair of, I think, the uh, the uh, committee for the Node.js project that uh, made their code of conduct, which is really cool. Uh, and she's just a really awesome Twitter follow if you don't know of her already. Uh, but anyhow, this project they're working on is a little uh, operating system kernel that's written in Rust and with a little tiny bit of assembly language. Um, it's really cool because they uh, use a lot of the sort of things that we um, that I learned this the semester in 2021 uh, at the University of Minnesota, uh, but they apply it in a really cool way, right? And that's one of the things that Ryan and I have talked about. Uh, Ryan, Brian, and I have all talked about at length, really, about uh, our computer science education is that it doesn't always give us the time to really like enjoy these really awesome things we're learning. Uh, you can and- listen to that discussion on the last episode of Podkid. 
Exactly. Exactly. I forgot that we made that our last episode. So thanks. Yeah, for I, I don't. I don't remember. I think I might have called this episode eighteen and the last one sixteen. I don't know what I've done. This is seventeen. Though. This is seventeen, despite what I might have said earlier. Listen to episode sixteen for our discussion on exploration of content within a field at a university. Yeah. Um, that was a good discussion, so you should definitely listen to that. Uh, but the project is really cool. The book is in progress right now, uh, but you're right, like you're writing multi-boot headers and all this other fun stuff. That yeah, I'm um, reading through. It's looking really cool. It's really really cool, and work is in progress on it right now. There are a bunch of things that they have kind of set up as issues in the GitHub repository, and you can go and squash them if you want to this weekend. I'm going to try and see if there's anything I can help out with it's just like a really darn cool project and anything that makes that sort of thing more accessible to people is pretty darn slick i was having a conversation with one of my friends who uh took uh you know software engineering and he took right. um programming languages this semester and we were discussing like when is it okay not to intentionally make something as simple as possible uh, right, in other right. words when is it okay to allow complexity and you know, he was arguing that, you know, let's always strive for simple and leave the complex as an option. But I'm, I am I basically took the stance that I don't want to be constrained to the simple forever. Let's just make yeah. some things complicated when they need to be. And I don't think you could really make this, this operating system kind of stuff any simpler without missing everything that it's about. Definitely. Definitely. I, I'd agree. It seems like the, the, the sort of simplicity that they're going for with this project is, is, uh, well, it's, ex it's, per, ex per, it's accessibility, maybe, maybe not simplicity. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not at, at this point, this, the simplicity is not really about like, like using, uh, a small, uh, you're not running an operating system uh, in Python. You're writing it in assembly, but it's easy exactly. to follow through. Exactly. 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 The it's it's clear without necessarily uh, ditching the underpinnings of what makes it what it is. Right. You know stuff stuff like multi boot headers like that's the same stuff that uh, you know Linux and other you know, presumably other operating systems, but I'm pretty sure mostly Linux uh, use in order to in order to make that stuff work. And they they walk you through it in a pretty pretty detailed but. Um, accessible way and that's pretty pretty darn slick i mean look at that you even get to make your own bootable iso i mean how cool is that right yeah totally and and, and, if, if, and you know sure you're using grub to make the booter boot loader thing yeah but so what i mean that's what people do yep absolutely yeah absolutely i think it's pretty cool uh and and full disclaimer auto run is not the file that makes your thing boot Stop telling me that it is, Dave Putnam. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, Disclaimer. Too good. Too good. Uh, so one other thing that I wanted to mention was uh, about what's going on in the Swift ecosystem. As you all might remember, a couple episodes we spoke about how Apple open sourced the Swift programming language and a couple of ancillary tools, uh, including but not limited to the awesome Swift package manager, which was designed by Max Howell, the same guy who designed Homebrew. Um, and there's been a bunch of stuff that's been shifted around since then. Uh, and kind of at the center of this is uh, a really awesome developer, uh, Erica. Uh, oh. Sedan. Sedan. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't, I, I know I've heard her name pronounced before, but I feel like an idiot because I just realized I have not, I did not remember it or think to remember it before I decided to talk about how awesome she is. Um, she's been writing up these really awesome kind of like recaps of what's been going on uh, or what sort of proposal, proposals for changes have been made uh, and kind of where the language is going, which is really cool because she's like, she's not like employed by Apple, but she is just really interested in what's going on with it. And uh, she's been like making really awesome proposals, for example, removing the uh, increment and decrement oper operators from the language because they're silly. Um, Why are those silly? I think wasn't was she behind the removal of a uh, C style for loop as well? Right, 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 right. Perhaps that's what I'm thinking of. I don't, I don't recall if she was behind the increment decrement operators, but I know for a fact she was behind the C style for loop removal. Uh, and it's just like really cool stuff like that. Really awesome things that remove. You know, the the whole point of Swift is to move forward with the cool things about Objective C without 
uh, necessarily feeling constrained to the baggage of an old C stat language. Um, and she seems like one of the real awesome community figures who's been pushing that kind of change forward. And it's really interesting to watch. And the stuff she writes is just like really, really, really fantastically detailed about uh, what goes into those sorts of changes. So highly recommend uh, a couple of posts there by her and a couple of um, updated things from the Swift uh, mailing list. And I'm going to add to the show notes real quickly. So who, who here knows Swift in any level? I've I, things, but that's about it. I did the lynda.com or net tutorial in May from the summer before. <laughs> that's all the code I've written. Okay, so who here can tell me what if case none comma none means? I say if Brandon. case comma none. Uh, oh, right, what, yeah. Whatever this blog post listed here, the the first code section. What exactly is going on, or the intent is going on? Right. So it's a it's a, it's a Swift uh, case statement, right, uh, or a Swift statement, uh, depending on depending on who you ask. Uh, if if they're a Rubyist or a uh, that or they hail from a C style language, um, it it can sometimes change in the syntax. Uh, let me just scroll up a little bit and I will see the thing that you're looking for. So I think that the situation right here, right, is if you are inside a switch statement, a case, uh, basically it's switching on a tuple. And yeah. if the tuple. Oh, okay. So it's okay. So it's, it's switching on a tuple. Yeah. Okay. That makes more sense then. Maybe. So, as, as, yeah. So essentially it's defining if, if it's a tuple made of, something of type none and right. none yep then then return nil yep yeah exactly okay hmm. interesting so, so i if... i guess that's not so i guess i was just confused because in uh in sml i believe it is called case but there's some more syntax that you use and in rust there isn't something called case but there's something called match which does the exact same thing right right in in bash it's like case and esac so you, yeah. you end it with esac because right of course bash hates me. yeah <laughs> oh man i don't know you know there's a lot of people who don't know what a tuple is but if i didn't have life with tuples i don't know if i'd have life yeah i gotcha i gotcha i did find her uh her proposal to the swift evolution um repository uh, that was removing C style for loops. The other one, removing increment and decrement operators, was uh, one from Chris Latner himself. And uh, some some other uh, follow up includes that yes, I have changed my uh, hip chat name back from uh, Brando Calrissian to um, LLVM Cool J, and I changed my job title to. Um, to some LL Cool J lyrics because how could you possibly not? <laughs> oh, okay. So what the what the what the intention is for the removal of C style loops is that instead of having the uh you know like uh, declaration condition incrementer, you would have yep. just uh just kind of like a declaration and then a range. Yep, absolutely. Although there does seem to be some kind of strangeness with the range also having a less than sign in it oh my gosh what does that mean i don't know but i don't have to know it's okay yeah <laughs> so that's uh that means that the range is exclusive Ex yeah okay okay if that's what that means that is perfectly fine but that is not clear from a person who's yeah, never seen this language before I think I need to learn some Swift soon. Yeah, yeah, it turns out. Swift's range operators are pretty darn awesome. I have to admit, they are pretty amazing. I, I went to a talk on it uh, at least a year and a half, possibly two years ago, about it. And I think um, there's a really good post that I'm going to try and track down. Yes, I think I found it here. So uh, That describes exactly what's going on. So this, is, this says it's been accepted for Swift 3. So what Swift are we on now? Uh, Swift 2.1, I believe. Okay, so is there, is there like a roadmap anywhere I could, uh, could, uh... I think uh, that's in one of the repositories. Is it's also, it's also sort of on the readme. 
yeah but in a loose way yeah okay that's cool I'm glad you asked. i think swift 3 is coming up next fall right right so so how do you guys so you know we've kind of grown up with the language in a loose way so how do you how do you feel about that growing up with a language and watching all of this development happen before you do you think that's really cool yeah oh it's pretty I think awesome it's, cool. I'm... It's, made, it's made me both wish i got in the language right in the beginning because i still haven't now we're let me let me tell you three. you do not wish that <laughs> yeah but then this at the same time yeah i'm glad i'm not because it's changing so much and i think by swift 3 it'll be a little more stable mm-hmm. i think that's the first version they're kind of say okay now there won't be major breaking changes just minor breaking yeah. changes <laughs> well i don't remember what it was i'm not so, sure it might have been in the the talk show review with craig yeah and, and john gruber but i'm not yeah, that was pretty cool sure that was a good that was episode. very cool 10 out of 10 would listen again <laughs> Indeed. maybe even Indeed. twice yeah so I'll, let me tell you. So from from when I started with Rust, um, I have this uh, thing about getting in early and then uh, leaving leaving late. And with Rust, is uh, I got in at point twelve, installed yeah. it that day, and then by the end of that week, point thirteen came out. And so I had to rewrite the war game in literally like three days because the differences were enough to, that I needed to rewrite the you know few. Not a few lines, but a few functions even. Right. And then I let it sit there for six months in old version land. And then Rust 1.0 came out, I think, in May. And then I rewrote it in June or July to meet the 1.0 standards. And uh, it turns out Rust is a language that um, is very much like C. And it doesn't compile if the compiler doesn't recognize your code anymore. Uh, It's not JavaScript, (laughs) in other words. So... (laughs) I guess what I would say is it's really cool to see Swift evolving and to watch the RFCs, to watch the changes, the pro- proposals and everything. But I think it's also really good. And I think Marco on his blog and, and on this podcast have said, you know, I don't want to get too attached to Swift right now because it is just changing so much. And right, right. not only, you know, porting code is one thing. Porting code is something you just do as a developer. But to unlearn something is even worse definitely yeah definitely definitely so i I, it it won't be this Mm -hmm. week but next week we'll talk about uh some other things that are similar to this so php is going through a renaissance right now and likewise to these changes suggested for swift there's also many proposals for changes to uh, JavaScript and PHP, and so we can talk about more about this next time. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, but, to conclude, we always have new Twitter followees. We're not really sure what to call them, though. Twitter followees. I'm down with it. Okay, we're gonna go with that. Followees. Uh, okay. <laughs> on on the 31st of of October, are we going to have to call it Twitter Halloween? Yes, we will yes. have to do that. All right, we'll make it happen. Okay. Halloween episode. Ooh. Okay, <laughs> I think creepy. Brian has to go first because I have nothing. All right, so every year about Christmas time, I see people retweeting App Santa. So it's just Santa for apps. So just discounts and deals run by the Icon Factory. Cool, cool way to get cheap app, uh, cheaper, good apps. Yeah. Next is Submarine. I read an app for iOS. Uh, I think it's a bit better than Alien Blue, a little more organized, nice themes. And then also uh, Julian Weiss, who, uh, who's the developer of Submarine. I thought I followed him on Twitter. Maybe I did at one point and then I unfollowed. Then I'm following again. I think he was a jailbreak developer back in the day, maybe still currently. Anyway, yeah, those are my new followers. So, so is, this the, uh, yeah. is this the Reddit app you use then? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I moved over to Submarine. Why well, I still have Alien Blue installed. I don't go on Reddit on my phone or iPad that much, but I guess I, bought it. I guess it looks nice. It. Yeah, I bought it. Uh, what was it? The week Star Wars came out when I was traveling without my computer, so it was a good time to Try get out, yeah. a new Reddit app. Yeah. And it's it's priced fairly reasonably, I would say. Is it what three dollars? Two ninety nine? I think it's just ninety nine cents right now. 
Okay. Yeah, that's how much I got it for as okay. well. I think just it's still sure. on sale or something. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have... I guess I won't talk about it today, but next week we could talk about all of the Reddit apps that I tried. Ooh, exciting. Yeah. Okay, what, what else do you have? It's all for me. Brandon? All right, so I've got uh, three new followees, people who I follow, um, who might be kind of in- of interest to you guys. The first is... Uh, Vivi Graubard, uh, who is with the U.S. Digital Service, um, she has a lot of awesome uh, info about uh, like 18F, which is a government agency that uh, is kind of changing the way that um, the government like acquires and builds uh, digital services, kind of like a fun little government skunk, skunk works. And she's also got a lot of in- fun info about what USDS is doing on kind of a larger scale. Um, she's just kind of a really cool follow too, um, as far as public affairs and like uh, kind of for those, you know, kind of in the Eric Mill, um, Tony Webster kind of uh, vein, if, if, if I may. Um, all cool people, all worth a follow. Also, uh, Steve Kitty, who created gi- dinosaur.js, which is a... Um, a JavaScript conference that's going to go on this summer in uh, Colorado. That's I'm pretty cool. I'm totally thinking about going because it looks like there are lots of cool people who are involved, including but not limited to Jen Schiffer, um, Space Witch on Twitter, which is, um, uh, you know, the the uh, Zygon Vectors, uh, the um, Jonathan Marvins of the world. They're all... Um, kind of seem to be watching this so it'd be cool to go because it looks like it's a cool sort of sort of thing and he's he's really cool he has, uh you know as far as conference runners go he seems to be um you know interested in doing some kind of fun uh kind of fun stuff so yeah it, it's clear that he runs with a cool crowd and it's clear that um the uh the what comes of this is probably going to be pretty cool and pretty cool to uh to watch yeah, and the, third and finally, the dinosaur kind of reminds me of those I- O'Reilly uh, cover drawings. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, similar. The O'Reilly books, they're pretty darn awesome. <laughs> and then third and finally is uh, Carrie Fisher, who is generally awesome and also has been particularly fun to follow around uh, the uh, stuff that's been going on with Star Wars. Um, her profile picture is of her pug, Gary who um, in a recent interview was uh, falling asleep, shall we say, during the interview. Nice. <laughs> oh, I did see that interview. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty pretty darn cool. It's uh, pretty fun. Uh, pretty fun to follow. Pretty fun to, uh, to see kind of what's going on, especially in the... Uh, in, in kind of the, the days and weeks after... Um, after the force awakens uh, came out on video so <laughs> there's one in particular that she retweeted that's kind of funny i'm gonna see if i can add that to the show notes right now um luke and leia buying a father's day card for uh darth vader so it's uh, something else you guys might get a kick out of it yeah that's pretty good Yep. So there you go. That's about all I have to say about that. Well, that sounds pretty good. No new follows for you, followees. No, uh, no, no, not not officially. All right. Well, I guess we should probably call it then. So, uh, where can we find you on the internet? Me? Well, Me? all of you, <laughs> everyone. Well. Let's see. The first place is going to be my website, brandon.mn, where I post things, including but not limited to uh, the new NPM module I just published and um, uh, slides from my, or I guess not really slides, kind of a web outline of my uh, lightning talk at JavaScript Minnesota last month. Pretty cool, um, man. I, I didn't, I wasn't there, but I heard, I heard about it. Oh yeah. Oh, it's very kind of you. It, it was fun. It was really fun. Cool folks. There's a lot of new people at JavaScript Minnesota, by the uh, way. It's it's um, growing. I see that list every month, and it's huge now. 
yeah, it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous, which is really, which is really great. Yeah, I agree. Um, so if you want to see me IRL in the interwebs, uh, or not in the interwebs, in the real world, um, one place to catch me is at JavaScript Minnesota every month until the end of days. Most months, oh, yes. Oh, I'm on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Brian? You can find me on Twitter at bman4789 or tech4789. You get to decide which one's more applicable for what you want to talk to me about. Ooh. Uh, or my website, brianm.me, which I actually updated last, uh, like, a couple days ago. My about page has more updates. So nice. that's fancy. Yeah. What about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on the Twitter at RyanMR and, of course, on the Google+. Plus. And maybe someday soon, a new special place out of the static realms of blogging somewhere that I might call my blog yet again Please. for like the 20th Ugh. time. Exciting. But in That's a static awesome. way. No more WordPress. None of that. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Hardcore HTML files? Uh, hardcore Hugo generator things. Okay. Yep. Well, this has been a great show, just like the last show we did, and uh, I hope we get to do it again soon. Yeah, good time. Until next time. Have a good one.